Aniline is a basic organic building block and can be found as a substructure in many different molecules. Examples are various dyes such as methyl orange and methyl red or common drugs like Tylenol. Industrially, aniline is produced through the reduction of nitrobenzene. I will be making it via the Hoffman rearrangement of benzamide. Under alkaline conditions and in the presence of sodium hypochlorite, amides will rearrange to an intermediate isocyanate. This isocyanate is then attacked by hydroxide ion, which will then yield a carbamic acid salt. Under Drupwirth acid, the salt will protonate to the unstable carbamic acid derivative and release CO2 to leave us with the desired amine. So, effectively, we're removing a CO group from an amide to yield an amine with one less carbon. To start the synthesis, we measure out 50 grams of benzamide and 200 milliliters of a 13% sodium hypochlorite solution. The hypochlorite is cooled in an ice bath to 0 degrees and 34 grams of sodium hydroxide are dissolved in the solution. The temperature is kept below 20 degrees to prevent decomposition of the hypochlorite. Some white precipitate is falling out of the solution, which is probably sodium chloride. This is also foreshadowing some unfortunate events in the near future, however at the time I didn't think much of it. A 500ml 3-neck round bottom flask is now mounted on the stand and the benzamide is added into the flask along with approximately 100ml of water to make a suspension of the benzamide. I hoped that this would kind of prevent the dust from escaping out of the flask, but this didn't work very well. A KPG stirrer is now attached to the middle neck of the flask. KPG stars are really useful for suspensions in highly viscous liquids because their power output is far superior to regular magnetic stirring. So although this setup is not strictly needed for this type of reaction, it will probably work better. The bearing of the stirrer is quite prone to wear, so it's important to be greased properly. Grease with a relatively high viscosity is preferable for this and I used Vaseline in my setup but the grease has to be compatible with the reaction conditions. The motor is now mounted above the stirrer. It's important to be precise in this step as any misalignments can cause the setup to vibrate and put stress on the motor and the bearing which can lead to damage. Perfect alignment is very hard to achieve, so a rubber tube is placed between the motor and the stirrer to give a bit of flexibility to the connection. An ice bath is placed below the flask, as the addition of the hypochlorite is quite exothermic. The reaction temperature should be maintained between 0 and 10 degrees Celsius for this step. The hypochlorite solution is placed in an addition funnel above the flask and with medium stirring the hypochlorite is added into the reaction mixture. Small bubbles can be observed forming in the mixture which is due to the evolution of carbon dioxide gas from the reaction. This also indicates that the reaction has started. The mixture is now left to stir overnight so we can sit back and relax and enjoy the reaction. the reaction, the mixture is now heated to about 80 degrees Celsius on a boiling water bath for 30 minutes. After heating a 
is done, all of the solid pieces have disappeared and the liquid is much clearer than before. Also, when left to stand for a bit, a thick black tarry layer forms on top. The setup is now disassembled and the raw reaction mix is transferred to a bigger flask for the next step. To fully decompose the intermediate carbamate salt, the mixture has to be acidified to a pH of about 2. Any unreacted hypochlorite is reduced with a few spoons of sodium metabisulfite to prevent any chlorine from forming. And after about 50 minutes of stirring, concentrated hydrochloric acid is added through an addition funnel. A lot of thick white smoke is produced during the addition. This is probably ammonium chloride, as ammonia is a byproduct of the hydrolysis of amides. Also, the solution has a very strong ammonial smell. It does give some very beautiful shots though. Once the pH is at around 1 to 2, the solution is left to stir for about 10 minutes to make sure all of the carbamates have decomposed. The aniline is also slightly basic, and under these conditions is present as the hydrochloride salt, so it has to be free-based by re-alkalizing the solution with sodium hydroxide to pH of about 10. I just dumped in a whole bunch and ended up at 14, but that's not an issue. Removing the aniline from the crude is quite simple as it co-distills over with water. So I just assemble a simple distillation setup and boil the mixture to steam distill out the aniline. To ensure all of the aniline comes over, about 400 milliliters of distillate are collected. There's some water and solid residue left in the flask, which have formed some nice patterns on the glass wall. A small oily layer has separated at the bottom of the flask, which is our crude aniline. However, a large part of the product is still dissolved, as aniline actually has a fairly high water solubility. So, to fully separate it from the aqueous phase, 80 grams of regular table salt are dissolved in the distillate to salt out the aniline. Rule of thumb is about 20 grams of salt per 100 milliliters of distillate. The salt has a very high ionic strength and therefore pushes less polar molecules out of the water. It also increases the density of the water and causes the aniline to flow to the top. The mixture is now moved to a separatory funnel and extracted three times with 50 milliliters of dichloromethane. All of the combined organic phases are then dried over potassium hydroxide and the dried organic phase is transferred to a round bottom flask. A distillation setup is then assembled. The dichloromethane comes over first, with a boiling point of 40 C. Once all of the DCM has been removed, we are left with a red, viscous oil in the flask. The apparatus is now connected to a vacuum line. The boiling point of aniline at atmospheric pressure is 184 C, but under vacuum, the boiling point decreases to about 80 C. The hot plate is now turned on again and the oil bath is heated to 150 C. 
The temperature isn't that important, but a higher oil temperature increases the distillation speed. Just don't set the oil bath on fire. Almost all of the crude product came over and we're left with a few droplets of brown junk in the distillation flask and some piss yellow aniline. So there's still some impurity left as pure aniline is almost colorless. It doesn't matter though as this is going to storage anyway and aniline gradually turns into red gunk as it gets older and I'll have to redistill it anyways. Now we get to calculate our yield. We obtain 7.63 grams, which corresponds to a percentage yield of 19.85%. This is not very good, and I was not satisfied with this result. So, I did it again. I weighed out another batch of chemicals and dissolved the hydroxide the hypochlorite. I suspend the benzamide in water, and I also turn on the stirring to pulverize any large chunks. Then I slowly drop in the hypochlorite solution. I let it stir overnight and heat to 80 degrees for one hour. Neutralize the sodium at a bisulfite where we get those beautiful yellow flakes and acidify to pH 1. Then add sodium hydroxide solution until the pH reaches 10 and steam distill the mixture. Add salt to precipitate the aniline and extract three times with DCM. Dry the extracts of potassium hydroxide, distill off the DCM and then vacuum distill the aniline. The product is much less yellow this time, so I produced a purer product in this run. But the yield is still garbage. In fact, it's even worse than the last run. So this got me thinking, what if the concentration of my hypochlorite isn't actually 13%? So I built a small setup to test the concentration of the hypochlorite. In the addition funnel, I filled some 12% hydrogen peroxide. The amount isn't important, it just has to be enough to fully react with the hypochlorite. When the peroxide and the hypochlorite react, they produce one molar equivalent of oxygen. I will then capture the oxygen in an inverted measuring cylinder, and by the assumption of ideal gas and so on, I can then calculate the moles of oxygen produced. So I open the stopcock and 63 milliliters of oxygen gas are collected in my measuring cylinder. This corresponds to 0.00258 moles of oxygen. I put in 3 milliliters of hypochlorite in the flask, meaning the concentration of my hypochlorite is 0.85 moles per liter, which is equivalent to 5.2%. This explains the terrible yield and also the white precipitate when dissolving the sodium hydroxide in the hypochlorite. Sodium hypochlorite decomposes to sodium chloride and oxygen in storage. And because half of the hypochlorite has already degraded, the solution already had lots of salt dissolved in it. So when dissolving the hydroxide, I oversaturate the solution and the salt crashed out. But now that I know the actual concentration of the hypochlorite, I can do a third run. So I once again measured out 200 milliliters of the hypochlorite and dissolved 20 grams of sodium hydroxide in the solution. Also this time, there's no precipitation. The concentration of the hypochlorite is effectively half of what I expected, so I'm using half of the hydroxide and benzamide. Also I kind of ran out of benzamide since I used most of it up during the previous runs. I weigh out 25 grams of benzamide. But instead of suspending the benzamide in water, in this run I dissolved it in 1,4-dioxane in the hopes that this would limit the hydrolysis of the benzamide under the strongly alkaline conditions. It also eliminates the necessity of a mechanical stirrer and a magnetic stirrer is used instead. The solution remains cloudy with a small amount of solid left at the bottom and is then transferred to an addition funnel and dripped in the hypochlorite over the course of two hours. 
the solution is once again stirred overnight and heated to 80 C for an hour and then separates into a beautiful deep red layer with some nice white flakes at the bottom. I then acidify to a pH of 1 and realkalize to about 10 for soda hydroxide solution. Now with the dioxane in the flask, it's not as simple as just steam distilling up the aniline, because now there's also a dioxane water azeotrope boiling before the aniline at around 80 C. So I distill that off first and it also creates this mesmerizing ripple effect in the condenser. That sounds sehr trippy aus. <laughs> Then, when the temperature approaches 100 C, I swap out the flask to a new one and collect the aniline water azeotrope. The workup is the same as before. Add salt to the aniline fraction to sort out as much as possible. In addition to that, I also sorted out the dioxane, as it might also contain some product. I then separate the dioxane and put it in a separate beaker. I extract the aniline from the aqueous phase three times with DCM and combine the organic layer with the dioxane. The organic phase is then dried with a mix of magnesium sulfate and potassium hydroxide and the organic layer is decanted into another flask. Off camera I also redissolve the drying agent in water and extract the phase with some more DCM because aniline forms a complex with magnesium which I forgot during the workup. All of the solvents are removed via distillation and I can now fractionate my distill under vacuum due to my new cow adapter which arrived in the making of this video. A cow adapter is a really useful tool. The way it works is you attach multiple flasks to the adapter and an outlet will direct the distillate to one of the flasks. The adapter can then be turned to another flask to collect a different fraction. The aniline is once again strongly colored yellow, but let's hope that our yield has improved. I accidentally didn't tear the scale right away and put a gram in the bottle before, but together with the 6.5 grams on the scale, our total yield comes out to be 7.66 grams, which gives us a 40% yield, meaning the yield is effectively doubled and my ego is pleased. I'm not sure if the change in the procedure helped to get a better yield, I might try it out at some point, but for now I have enough aniline for my future projects. One thing I have planned is the synthesis of methyl orange, for which I will need dimethyl aniline. Until then, I wish you all a pleasant day and stay tuned.